Had someone told my younger self that the things that I would hold dearest to myself later on in life, my family and my businesses, could be rewinded to a starting moment at an exact moment in time, I wonder if I would have chosen the path that I have. For these moments were not the results of a well-thought-out plan that took months of preparation or thought. They were mere accidents, coincidences, and the results of conversations, most often with strangers. At the age of 17, I was working at Sports World, our local gym, manning the front desk and keeping things running smoothly. One day, one of our female gym members came up to pay her monthly fees, and she complained to me about having to feel like she always had to rush her workouts to rescue her three-year-old from our overcrowded daycare center. She expressed that she wished that we had activities for children, considering there were always at least a dozen or so in the gym at all times. My mind began to whirl. I loved wiping down gym equipment and folding towels for minimum wage, but I had been trained in classical dance since the age of two. It was really all I wanted to do with my time, and my job at the gym most definitely cut into my classes. I talked to Lou Dean, our gym manager, the next day, who gave me permission to rent the aerobics room for only $20 a month. Quite a steal. Very good job, Perk. To this day, I'm grateful for that. The next day, I signed up a I taped a sign-up sheet to the front counter of the gym, and within a week, I had 80 children signed up for classes. The, next week, the first week of the next month, we were up and rolling, and my first business was on its way. Now, multiply 80 kids by my tuition of $25 a month and deduct my rent of only $20 a month, and I just might have been the richest junior at Highland High School. I shortly quit my job at the front desk so I could concentrate on the gym's new dance fitness program. And 20 years later, I now run a nonprofit performing arts theater with a strong volunteer and scholarship program that offers lessons in the performing arts to children in need of assistance. Now, I want you to think back on your own life with me for just a moment. I want you to try to think of a couple of your key moments. We all have them, but we don't often think about them. I want you to think of the moments in which you can now, retro, retroactively speaking, see when your life changed. I want you to think back to the people that were involved in those moments and that were influential in, the, in those moments and in the decisions that you made. Now I want you to think about times that you may have been actively involved in someone else's life-changing moment. Most likely, you shouldn't be able to think of this moment. That is because we cannot understand or recognize what is going to be valuable to another person. We don't know what their substantial moment will be. Though we like to plan as much as we can, it's the unscripted moments and the off-the-cuff comments that we recognize as most genuine, and those are the moments that usually lead to these life-changing situations. Now, I have a terrible, terrible memory. I know people say that, but mine's really bad. And when I'm talking to people, I'm consciously thinking, I don't need to remember this. Or I'm thinking, I probably should try to remember this. For some reason, I think I have a very finite amount of memory up in this head, and I don't have to let everything in. I don't know what it is. But I've very often been in conversations with people as they're throwing my own words back at me, and these are words I could swear I've never said. Now, part of this is definitely due to my bad memory. But a bigger part of this is due to the, these, the fact that these words were not substantial to me as I was saying them. But they did have an impact on the receiver that heard them at that time. And they remember those words that I can no longer recall that I said. Every day we speak an average of 13,500 words. Women, we're up near the 20,000 mark. People like me are probably around 30, maybe pushing 40 on a good day. But when she balances us out with our male counterparts, we're at about 13,500 words each day. How many of these words do we really think about? How many are intended to be kind, to uplift another person, or to make a change in their life? Our words leave behind impressions of who we are, and some people will never forget the things that we say to them. This next slide shows a conversation between me and one of my closest friends just two days ago. I do not have any recollection whatsoever of this event happening. It actually happened at the gym I was talking about when we were probably 16, 17 years old. But it's still something that occasionally she thinks about. At the age of 15, I had the opportunity to live in New York City for a short time during one of my summers, dabbling my feet in the modeling world. I remember the exact conversation with my father in which I begged and pleaded and promised him 
and that one day I would pay him back every cent if he let me go. The trip ensued, and as I look back on the decisions that I had to make away from home, at such a young age, the words come back to me that were said about myself to myself by stylists and coaches and photographers. And I remember the self-doubt that crept into my body that was then followed by surges of confidence to help me get through those experiences. I remember the excitement. I remember the stupid decisions that I made on the streets. I remember the euphoria of all the new people I met in restaurants and dance clubs and who no doubt thought I was older than the 15 years old that I was. I remember one night sitting in a pizzeria with two men from Africa as they bought us a slice and kept us up until the wee hours of the morning telling us all about their journey to America. I remember walking into the supper club, which I'd seen in Cosmo magazine, and so that alone was exciting enough, but I remember walking in to the base of a Whitney Houston remix and the lights flashing and people dancing all over the place. That night, I danced with a big group of people, and half of them I couldn't tell were boys or girls, and it was all so exciting, I didn't even care. It was the most exciting moment I'd had. I saw Cats on Broadway for the first time, and I heard the tunes of Les Mis from the streets in front of the theater. I had my first cab ride, and I didn't die like I thought I would, and I didn't cry when the cab driver turned around and told me to shut up when he got tired of all the endless questions and stories from the Idaho girl in the back seat. I bought my family members hideous New York City shot glasses because I didn't even know what a shot glass was. I only cared that it had stamped I love NYC on it. When I returned home, I talked to my dad about, well, actually, it was about two years ago, I talked to my dad about paying back this money because I realized I hadn't. I'm sure you were all wondering if I had. I have not. And he refused the payment, but he also let me know that it was very evident on my return, the changes that this trip and this experience had made in me. I was only 15, and he said, when you returned home, it was so clear what that trip had done for you and how much you had grown as a result of the people and the cultures and the things that you saw. That's not something that he knew was going to happen to me or that I first saw going into that trip. But that experience has undoubtedly carved the path of who I've become. I really couldn't say this better myself, so I'd rather quote directly from Lois A. Cheney. The people that are important to you and the people that are unimportant to you, they cross your life and they touch it with love and carelessness and they move on. There are people that leave you and you breathe a sigh of relief and you wonder why you ever came in contact with them in the first place. And then there are those who leave and you breathe a sigh of remorse and you wonder why they had to go and leave such a gaping hole. People move in and out of each other's lives and each leaves his mark on the other. You find that you're made up of bits and pieces of all those who have touched you. You are more because of it, and you would be less if they had not. Pray to God that you can accept these bits and pieces in humility. I have not kept in, one per in contact with one person from that New York trip, but I think back on that trip very often. When I asked you to think about your moments that matter, and everybody should have them, nobody does not, how many of you have people involved in those moments that weren't a part of your life to begin with, or aren't a part of your life anymore? It's important to recognize those people. They're probably not your family members or your best friends or people that are around you every day, but they've been placed in your path for a reason, to help you make decisions that needed to be made for you to be who you are today. My husband and I are the proud title holders of a US patent for the dripstick, a fun cup that holds frozen, end, frozen, ice creams in one, or frozen treats in one end and an ice cream comes in the other. When we started this business, the timing could not have been worse. I was five months pregnant with our fifth child. My oldest was only seven years old. My husband was a medical resident working 70 to 80 hour weeks. We were broker than a joke, and we lived across the country from all of our family and friends, making any assistance from loved ones extremely difficult. For some reason to me, this was like the perfect time to start a new adventure. Things progressed very rapidly, and within months, we were retelling the dripstick in over 4,000 retailers around the country. I found myself standing in a booth in the largest children and baby show in Las Vegas, and 
needless, I was very much in over my head. I never would have admitted it now, but looking back, I can see everything I did not know, and then I was just faking it, trying to make it. The last day of the trade show, my husband called me to tell me that I would not be boarding my flight to come home, but that he'd rerouted my flight and I was flying to New Jersey, and I'd been booked on the big idea with Donnie Deutsch. Now, this show was canceled five years ago, but to entrepreneurs such as myself and my husband, this was our favorite show. Does anybody, did anybody watch the show? Does anybody remember the show? Yes, okay, love this show. So Donnie Deutsch was a good friend of Donald Trump's, and he appeared regularly, or still does, on The Apprentice and The Today Show. This was the first of many exper television experiences for me, but it undoubtedly has been the most valuable, with myself receiving seven minutes of uninterrupted airtime with one of the top business gurus in the country. It also replayed about 13 times. With the, in the first week following the filming of this show, this, it catapulted our business into mass retailers I never would have been able to reach on my own. It was very instrumental in the success of our invention. Rewind back a few months before this. My week consisted of a daily phone call from one of our top mom and pop retailers, Dana Banana. I love her name, Dana Banana. Dana Banana was one of our first customers. She was also my most difficult customer. She did not like emails. She did not believe in fax machines. She required personal communication for each and every single order that she put in. Now, most of you out here today don't know me, but for those who do, you might know that my own mother recently has spoken to me about my current voicemail recording that just tells callers to shoot me a text. Do not leave me a voicemail that will take me a week to listen to and get back to you. I just simply have a very hard time finding time for personal phone calls. But Dana Banana insisted on these phone calls. She wanted to know about my day. She had questions about my family, and she wanted to know what I was doing at the exact moment that we were speaking, which was usually nursing a baby strapped to my chest while packing a box of dripsticks and talking to her on the phone. I, I enjoyed Dana Banana for the business that she brought me, but I had a very hard time justifying the hour-long phone calls every week for her order. Our average case count of a dripstick was 36 pieces or 144, but Dana insisted on 12, so she could call me the next Monday and order 12 more and talk again. I remember countless times complaining to my husband about these phone calls at night when we were going to bed, and I recall even one time telling him I was re about ready to fire her as our customer. After my appearance on The Big Idea, I, book, I booked The Today Show and Good Morning America. The Today Show booking happened to be a segment with Donny Deutsch, which I was not aware of when I was booked, and I hadn't seen him since my appearance on his show almost a year before. I had always wondered how The Big Idea had heard about this small town Idaho girl and knew how to get a hold of me. So when we were at that taping, I don't remember who I was talking to, the bad memory kicking in. But in the green room, I did ask how in the world that show had heard about me a year before. And I was told that they were looking for a new entrepreneur for, this, for a new segment for the show, and that one of their show producers had walked into a novelty store in the town that they were in at that time called Dana Banana. When they asked Dana Banana what her favorite top-selling product was at that moment in time, she handed them a dripstick, told them all about my family and my story, and gave them my phone number. To this day, I don't think that Dana Banana has any idea of the effect that she made on my business. They gave me these backstage, so clearly they've learned enough about me in this experience to know I would need them. <laughs> they're in my way, so they're going to rest down there. The biggest effect of my business was the result of someone I didn't even want to communicate with. There will always be a reason why you meet people. Either you need to change your life, or you're going to help them change theirs. 20 years ago, when in college, I was engaged to be married to my boyfriend of four years, and I had a big test the next morning. A high school rival turned college friend called me and asked me if I would drive her to a dance up at the institute at ISU so she could meet a blind date. Being engaged and having a big test the next day, I didn't feel that a dance was where I was supposed to be, so I protested repeatedly until she let me know that in case her date went wrong, she would need a ride home. So when we arrived at the dance, I settled myself in a nearby classroom and pulled out my medical terminology cards to, 
flashcards to prepare for my nursing test the next morning. She went on into the dance, and a few minutes later, a friend of mine from high school, Jerry, walked by, and his exact words when he saw me were, what in the heck is Messina Merrill doing studying for a test when there's a dance going on? And he asked me to go in the dance with him. Now, Jerry was my favorite dance partner in high school. The boy knew how to waltz, he was a strong partner, and best of all, he was safe. We had only ever been just friends. During our first dance together, a handsome Dean Kane lookalike walked into the room, and our eyes locked. And I knew I was in trouble. I'd never seen this boy before. And when he asked me to dance, I felt that I should say no. I knew I should say no. But his beautiful face made me say yes, and we were shopping for rings two weeks later. I can honestly say that I have no idea if these two friends of mine to this day have any idea of the role they played in this part of my life that night, or if they even knew that this happened that night. I thought that moment I didn't want to go to that dance. I had no idea what was in store for me that night and what turn my life was about to take, different from the plan that I'd already set out for it. These people were a huge part in my life plan coming together, and they had no idea that they were, just as I had no idea years earlier when this girlfriend asked my high school sweetheart to our homecoming dance a whole month before the dance, before I'd had a chance to ask him, that this girl who was bringing out the most intense of all hormonal girl teen rage in me would one day be the exact same person that would be so instrumental in me meeting my soulmate and the best thing that's ever happened to me. How many of your life moments have come from experiences you didn't even want to have? And really think about it, because for me there are many. Most of my big life moments have come from experiences that I fought or I didn't know what was coming and I didn't want them to ha didn't want it to happen. I didn't want to go to that dance, and I was so frustrated with Dana Banana, I was ready to fire her. I never thought I'd fire customers. Definitely not the best business plan. Why do we fight these moments? The top source of stress in America is big life change. We unconsciously sense the stress that these life moments are going to create for us. And in self-protection mode, we try to avoid that stress by preventing that moment from happening, not being able to differentiate between good and bad stress or foresee what that stress may lead to for us. Though marrying my husband was the best decision I've ever made, it did definitely cause stress with that boyfriend of four years when I had to explain to him what had happened that night. Though Dana Banana played a significant role in the success of my invention, that invention has caused immeasurable stress, both good and bad, for the last 11 years for us. Most of my valuable life lessons have been learned by people who are in and then out of my life. These are the bad employees, the broken business arrangements, and the usually not fun lessons that we don't enjoy going through. Situations such as these aren't fun. We all have these moments and these people that bring extreme frustration into our lives. When these moments are happening, we wish for them to go away, we wish that they'd never happened in the first place. And oftentimes we wish that we'd never met these people. But in retrospect, it should be easier for us to recognize the lessons and the growth experience that comes from these people and what they have to offer us at these times in which they are challenging us. We may even be able to admit that from these people is where we've grown the most. Now we all have different views. Some are religious, some are not. Even within the same religion, there should be different, dif different personal views and beliefs. But I do believe that there is a master plan for each one of us and that we were all sent here to grow and to learn from each other and to challenge and influence each other's lives. I believe that long ago, during a time in which we cannot presently recall, that a master did put these people in our path for our life and he did this for us to learn, to grow, and to challenge and for them to challenge us. It's not a stretch for me to believe that the people that have hurt us the most and challenged us the most just may have been the people who loved us the most in this previous life. And they were needed the most to help us create the biggest plans that, that, that our life path has, needs. As we age, I do think it's easier to look back and have a nicer view of how far we've come and how these paths in our lives have twisted and turned to become the beautiful life experience that we are all having together today right now. 
Thank you.